Hi, as I said, I'm uh, John Slattery. I'm the Vice Dean for Research and Graduate Education in the School of Medicine and have the pleasure every few weeks of, of introducing speakers at our, our Science and Medicine series. Um, you should all know that the speakers in this series are selected by the uh, elected members of the uh, Council on uh, 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 Research and Graduate Education. And if you would like to nominate somebody to speak in this series, you could send the nomination to me and I'll see that it uh, gets into uh, court. <clears throat> today, it's, it's really a pleasure um, to welcome Dimitri Christakis today. Um, Dimitri is uh, a Renaissance man, I see, because he took a degree in uh, English literature at Yale, actually after having been born in New Haven. Uh, uh, and then went uh, to do uh, his uh, MD degree at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, then eventually completed an, uh, an MPH here at the uh, University of Washington. He did his, uh, his residency training in uh, pediatrics at Children's, uh, associated here with the university, and went on to do uh, Robert Ward's uh, Johnson Fellowship. Uh, he's gone through the ranks here at UW uh, with primary appointments, um, always in pediatrics and uh, adjunct appointments in the Department of Health Services uh, at, uh, in the School of Public Health. <clears throat> Currently, he's got quite a set of titles. Uh, he's the George Adkins Professor of Pediatrics at the, at the University of Washington, uh, still adjunct professor in uh, Department of Health Services. He's the director for the Center of, uh, for Child Health, Behavior and Development at, C at uh, SCRI, uh, and of course, an attending pediatrician at, at Children's, um, as well as in his spare time being editor in chief of JAMA Pediatrics. Um, he's received quite a bit of recognition throughout his career, not surprisingly. Um, just maybe a couple of highlights. He's a uh, member of the Washington State Academy of Sciences. And in uh, 2010, he received the research award for lifetime contribution from the um, Academic uh, Pediatric Association. Um, his laboratory has been focused on the effects of early environmental influences on child health and development. Uh, and his passion has been um, and is developing actionable strategies to optimize the cognitive, emotional, and social development of preschool children. Um, and he pursues this passion uh, in a variety of settings, in the exam room, room in the community, um, and uh, more recently in uh, newborn mice. Um, today, and, and as I think you also know, he's widely interviewed uh, nationally uh, and, uh, and speaks uh, widely on, on these issues to lay audiences, uh, to parents, as, as well as to scientific meetings. Um, his title today is Of Mice and Children, Understanding the Perils of Early Media Use. And Dimitri, I have to say that this is untimely. I was visiting my grandchildren in South Carolina for the last two weeks. They just turned four and I should have had this before I went down there so I could pester the parents to do the right things, but take it away. Thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry, I feel like, okay. Thank you very much. It's truly an honor to be here today. Um, just a quick word about the title of Mice and Children, I, I'll be talking about both of them. And I'll be talking about the perils of early media usage. And um, I'm, this is not to say that there's not upsides to the usage of media in children's lives. And I'll end the talk talking a little bit about that. But I think the evangelist uh, who, who forced media, voiced media on us, uh, put give plenty of oxygen to the upside. And I fear that we don't spend enough time talking about the perils. So, a little bit about me and how I got to where I am now. Uh, John mentioned probably too many details about my past, but um, I was trained as an epidemiologist and health services researcher here at the University of Washington. And early in my career, I uh, focused on translating evidence into practice, which is sort of was then the sort of sine qua non of health services research. But something happened to me in 1998. Um, I became a father for the first time 
And I, um, I took paternity leave when my son was eight weeks old, which I should have known better than to do because that is the period that colic really crescendos. And um, I spent a month with my son uh, <laughs> um, tethered to my chest, bouncing up and down, uh, wondering what was going on with him. And um, that really led me to refocus my research, uh, as John said, uh, the lab my laboratory's mission is to determine modifiable factors in children's early environment that can positively impact their cognitive, social, emotional, and behavioral development, and to develop actionable strategies to optimize them. And in the three hours I have today um, to, to summarize my, my lab's work, um, I'm going to talk just about two aspects of those, uh, the cognitive and behavioral. And for cognitive, I'll talk about overstimulation and attention spans. And for behavioral, I'll speak about digital addiction. And I chose to focus on media effects today because um, they have been such a huge part of our lives for a long time, but uh, really that's all been accentuated uh, in the past year. So uh, starting first with the cognitive aspects, um, I want to give a little bit of context here by think, talking about executive functioning, which is the highest order thinking. It's really what separates humans from uh, all animals, in fact, including, uh, in some respects, our, our closest primate relatives. Um, it's focused in the prefrontal cortex of the brain, as many of you know. And there are three components to executive function. Uh, the first is self-control, which is the ability to stay focused and resist temptation. The second is working memory, which is the ability to hold information in mind while mentally manipulating it. And the third is cognitive flexibility, which is the ability to apply something learned in one context uh, to another one and to modify it accordingly. Now, all three of these components are really essential to the high order thinking that distinguishes humans. But it's my opinion, uh, and I hope I'll convince you that I'm right, that of these three, self-control is the most important. Now I'll illustrate this with a sort of a funny thing that many people are probably familiar with, which is the Stanford Marshmallow Test. And this was a test done years ago in preschoolers, uh, actually at a Stanford preschool that took care of children of faculty and staff from Stanford. And children were presented with two marshmallows and told that they could have one marshmallow now, uh, or if they waited 10 minutes and didn't eat that first marshmallow, they could have two. Um, and the test was to see how many kids had enough self-control to wait the full 10 minutes. Only about 30% of kids were able to wait the whole time. Um, and here's a cute sort of modern uh, recapitulation of that experiment to give you some context. So here's the deal. There's a marshmallow. You can either wait, and I'll bring you back another one. So you can have two, or you can eat it now. So you can eat it now, or you can wait, and I'll bring you back two, okay? Okay, I'll be back. Okay, so I have one marshmallow for each of you. Okay, this is one. Don't eat it. And here's the deal. You can either eat it now, or you can wait till I get back, and you can have two, okay? Okay. So eat it now, or wait till I get back, and you can have two. And I'll be back in a little If we wait, we, we'll, you'll get us two? Yep, if you wait, you'll get two, or you can eat it now, whichever you want. Okay, I'll be back in a little bit. I wonder what we're going to do. Are we going to eat it? Is it going to eat something? But we're still not going to be too. But if you wait until she gets back, she'll give you two. She still won't give you two because you ate it. So I love it. And I didn't eat a single bite of mine. So don't show her, okay?
Okay, so I have this marshmallow, and you can eat it now, or if you wait a little bit, I'll bring back two for you, okay? Yes, I'm gonna look for some more, but you sit here, and if you haven't eaten that one, I'll bring you back another one, okay? I'll be right back. The Stanford Marshmallow Experiment was a kind of acute test of, of self-control, but there have been much more robust studies done. Um, in 2011, uh, Moffitt and colleagues published in PNAS a study using the Dunedin longitudinal data. And for those of you that don't know that, that's a birth cohort following over a thousand children over 30 years. It's obviously observational, but it's very well, well controlled and has excellent follow-up. And what they measured in part was children's self-control in quintiles in preschool. So these are, you can see going from low to high, uh, how, how, how well they were able to exhibit self-control when they were very young. And then I've shown you here uh, a few of the outcomes they looked at, which were substance, substance abuse, poor physical health and socioeconomic status. And you can see that there is, uh, across these domains and the other eight or 10 that they looked at, a consistent pattern that self-control in early childhood predicted better outcomes uh, as adults. Now, early experiences are essential to developing uh, the brain and all of the attendant features of the brain. The newborn brain, the typical newborn brain is 333 grams and it triples in size in the first two years of life. It's an extraordinary period of brain growth, really unparalleled over the lifespan. And you can see that here. Um, see how, note how steep the rise is early in childhood. And then in fact, the brain isn't fully developed until uh, the early twenties. And then you can find yourself, or certainly I can find myself over here and see why I'm having such a hard time getting Zoom to work today. A traditional teaching is that we're born with a lifetime supply of neurons. That's not, not, not generally uh, believed to be true anymore. There is some neurogenesis later in life, but the bulk of them are present at birth. It's not the neurons that, that grow early in life, it's the synapses that form between neurons. And those synapses are formed by early experiences. If you will, the mind is fine tuned to the world that children inhabit. And to give an example of that, um, any child born anywhere in the world can learn to speak any language fluently. But if they don't hear certain sounds early in their lives, they can learn another language later, but they will never sound like a native speaker. So a child born in mainland China can learn to speak fluent Mandarin. She could learn to speak fluent English, but if she learns to speak fluent Mandarin and doesn't hear those English sounds until later in her life, she'll never be able to roll her R's. We all know such people. It's not because they were born without that ability. It's because their mind tuned itself to a world in which those sounds didn't exist. That critical window closed and, and there it is. 
Now to illustrate this, this cartoon demonstrates neuro neuronal connections at birth at three years and at 15 years of life. And at birth, each neuron is connected to about 1500 others. By three years, each one is connected to about 15,000 others. And there's a gradual pruning over time uh, based on which connections are not being reinforced. Shown in this slide is the breathing of a one day old infant listening to music. And you can see here her breathing when Mozart is playing and then Stravinsky comes on and then Mozart again. Now I show you this not to present an infantile critique of classical music, although those of you that listen to classical music might have a hypothesis about why Stravinsky did this to this poor child's breathing pattern. I show you this to demonstrate that there is a discernible reaction um, even at birth to the different sounds that a baby is hearing. Likewise, executive function skills build into the early years. You can see here again that the early experiences of childhood are essential to building the executive function, uh, executive function proficiency. In fact, this has led many people to develop specific curricula for young children. This is from Adele uh, Diamond's uh, Habits of the Mind curriculum. And you can see here a simple game called Walk the Line in which a toddler is instructed to try to keep both feet uh, on this line, putting one in front of the other. And while this might seem like a test of motor skills, it's actually, well, while those obviously are essential, it's really a test of his ability to focus, right? He has to look at the line, put one foot right on the, in front of the other one on the line and not be distracted by everything that's going on around him. And the theory is that, that those are the sorts of skills that developed early prevent you from eating the marshmallow and subsequently lead to better health outcomes later in life. Now we've known for many years that too little stimulation early in life is very, very bad for brain development. I show you here two PET scans of kindergarten children. Uh, and as you may know, PET scans are measures of brain activity. The brighter the light, the more active that area of the brain is. And on the left is a normal kindergartner. And on the right, is a PET scan of a child raised in profound deprivation. This is actually the brain of a Romanian orphan. Those of you that may remember the experiences from those Romanian orphanages, these were kids, children who were raised in closets with essentially absolutely no human contact or uh, stimulation. So we've known for a long time that too little stimulation is bad for brains, but for a while, one of the focuses of my lab has been, what about too much? Is it possible to overstimulate the developing brain? Are there good stimulations and bad stimulations? And is there too much of a bad stimulation or even too much of a good stimulation that can ultimately lead to untoward effects? Now, the reason this is important is because we've been technologizing childhood for some time. In 1970, when I was a child, the average age at which children began to watch television was four years, like this cute little girl. And today, based on research that we've done and others, the typical age at which children begin to watch TV or screens is four months. A dramatic shift, obviously, in the age at which children begin to watch. And it's not just the age at which they watch, it's the amount of time they spend with screens. These data are somewhat dated, but you can see here that preschool children, on average, spend about four hours on front of a screen per day if you combine childcare and home usage. And keep in mind that the typical preschool child is only awake for about 12 hours a day. So they're spending somewhere between a third to half of their waking time in front of a screen of some kind. And this brings us in a weird way to baby Einstein. Now, this product um, came on the market in the early 2000s and made all kinds of outrageous claims about what it could do uh, to babies' brains. I wanna show you here a brief 20 second segment from Baby Einstein to give you some sense of what it was. In that 20 second segment, there were seven scene changes, one every three seconds. It's the most exhausting day on the farm since uh, John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. 
And of course, it's nothing like being on a farm. As, as adults, your mind is trying to make a coherent narrative out of this, and you can't. It's completely discombobulated. It makes no sense. Babies aren't trying to make a coherent narrative out of it. They're not, uh, they're not able to do that. But what's keeping them engaged in the screen is all of those changes, all those dramatic shifts in venue. Now, we've all known that there's been a rise of ADHD uh, in the US and globally. And for those of you that don't know, ADHD is characterized by impulsivity, inattention, and hyperactivity. Really, a decrease in, 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 in many of the core features of executive function. In fact, it's 30% more common today than it was 20 years ago. And surely this has something to do with increased ascertainment, but I think there's a general consensus that in fact, it is more prevalent. We've also known that there is a genetic basis for ADHD. Uh, here I summarize about 20 studies that have looked at the genetic association uh, in, in, in concordant uh, twins. And when you look at concordant twins, the heritability is about 75%. I've summed all these studies up for you. And of course, we know that identical twins uh, are completely identical with respect to their DNA. So if in fact ADHD was entirely genetic, we would expect that to be closer to 100%. So like most things now, we believe that there's sort of a gene environment interaction, that there's certain candidate genes that have been identified, certain environmental triggers that, uh, that come together to create the phenotype of ADHD. The Surgeon General himself in 1999 said, for most children with ADHD, the overall effects of these gene abnormalities appear small, suggesting that non-genetic factors also are important. Now that's ADHD, and I wanna emphasize that I'm not talking about ADHD, and, and, and here's why. Like most biologic phenomenon, attentional capacity uh, follows a normative distribution. And as we frequently do as clinicians, we draw a line somewhere, typically at the 95th percentile, and say that everybody on this side of the line uh, meets criteria for a diagnosis, in this case, ADHD. And then on this side of the line, we say that they're fine. There is no, no uh, measurable pathology. But in fact, this, this dichotomization belies the reality. When I showed you the data from Moffitt's group, there was no threshold, right? There was a continuous monotonic relationship. The child on one side of this, even though they don't meet criteria for ADHD, is going to face significant challenges over their life. So in, in, in my laboratory, we talk about attentional capacity as a continuous variable and seek to find ways to, to maximize it, to optimize it for all children. Now, as I mentioned, one of the things that we got interested in early on was this issue of overstimulation. And briefly stated, the overstimulation hypothesis that we had was that prolonged exposure to rapid image change during this critical period of brain development would precondition the mind to expect high levels of stimulation, and that would lead to inattention in later life. Put another way, you watch enough baby Einstein day on the farm as a baby, and then when you go to a farm, when you're five or six or seven years old, it's boring. How come you have to walk everywhere? How come things don't happen faster? And we first tested this hypothesis uh, using an observational data set and found that in fact, the more television children watch before the age of three, the more likely they are to have attention problems at age seven. And we also found that the more cognitive stimulation they received, and we measured cognitive stimulation in terms of how often parents read to their children, sang to them, took them on outings, et cetera, the less likely they were to have attention problems at age seven. Specifically, each hour of TV that a child watched before the age of three increased their risk by about 10% of having attention problems at school age. And each hour of cognitive stimulation decreased the risk by about 20%. So if you will, these are two sides of the same coin. There's certain things you can do early in life to promote a child's attentional capacity and certain things you can do uh, that, that diminishes it. Now, if our hypothesis was true that it was overstimulation that drove these effects, you might imagine that content matters, right? That, that the pacing of the shows that children watched would make a difference. And so we followed up that study with a subsequent one. Um, and I wanna give you two examples of what I mean by different types of content. The first, 
is from the Powerpuff Girls movie. This is the opening sequence. Okay, so that's one example of content. Many of you may not have seen it, but in fact, the Powerpuff Girls movie was the first movie to be rated PG for nonstop frenetic animated action. And I'm not making this up, that's the back of the box. And I wanna, I wanna contrast that with something I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which is uh, Mr. Rogers. And here's a segment for Mr. Rogers. Oh, hi, Chris. I'm fine. How are you? Good, thanks. I brought my television neighbor to see what a restaurant was like. Oh, I'm so glad. Can I show you a table? Certainly. I'm awfully busy today. One of the waitresses is ill. I see. So I'm sort of doing double duty. How about this? This is fine. Thank Grand. you very much. Sit down and I'll be right back. All right. When you come to a restaurant, usually somebody shows you what table you're supposed to sit at. And uh, one of the first things you do is to put your napkin either on your lap or up here. And then, well, this is the way a table is set. So um, Fred Rogers invented reality TV. He's not credited with it. But, but you know, I, 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 um, it's not reality, right? If anything, the pacing of this program is slower than reality. The, the waitress says she's awfully busy, but she doesn't seem the least bit hurried. Uh, it's soothing to watch this. It's in no way overstimulating. And of course, it takes place um, in real pacing. And when we repeated our study looking at the content that children watch before the age of three, well, we found that educational programs like Mr. Rogers didn't increase the risk of attention uh, problems at all. That Entertainment programs like the Powerpuff Girls movie increased it by about 60%. And um, violent uh, programming, which I didn't show you an example of, which tends to be even more frenetically paced, increased it by over 110%. Now, all of these studies that we did were observational in nature. Obviously, I can't ethically uh, randomize young children to watch different types of programs for hours at a time and then study them over time. Um, and so uh, many years ago, um, together with a colleague at Seattle Children's Research Institute, um, we started to develop a mouse model of television viewing in infancy. And what you see here is, is how it works. Basically, the, the mice are put into uh, cages that have audio from the cartoon channel uh, piped in, and there are photorhythmically activated lights around there that essentially simulate uh, visual, the visual cues of television. And the mice are basically starting at 10 days of life when they can start to hear. They're overstimulated for six hours a day uh, for 42 days, which represents their entire childhood uh, spent watching, watching a fair amount of television. And then we do a series of behavioral tests on them. And I'll show you a couple of them here. The first one measures activity and risk-taking. And it's called the open field test. And the way this works is you put the mouse into an open field, this black box here. And mice in, in general, um, for obvious reasons, they don't have many friends in the wild, are very wary of going into the middle of an open field and will prefer to stay in the perimeter. But of course they have a foraging instinct and they will venture into the middle of the open field in search of something to eat. What we do is we take advantage of the fact that we have a white mouse on a black background and we, we track the mouse with an optical tracker and see how it spends its time. And you can see this mouse is on the left and you see that it spends the vast majority of its time on, on the perimeter. And you see a different mouse on the right. And you can see there's very different, very obvious differences uh, between these two paths. One obvious one is one spends a lot more time on the perimeter. And the other you can see not only goes in to the perimeter more, but is much more uh, hyperactive, is much more kinetic. And when we compare entries into the center between the two, um, as well as time spent in the center between the two, you can see that there are dramatic differences. So overstimulated mice are risk takers and they're hyperkinetic in nature. 
The other test I'll show you is what's called the novel object recognition. And this tests short-term memory. And the way this works is you put the mouse in a cage with two objects that are identical and you allow it to explore them for as long as it wants. And then you remove the mouse, you remove one of the objects and you replace it with a novel object and you bring the mouse back in to see how it spends its time. And a normal mouse will spend more time on the novel object because after all, it knows what this one is and it wants to explore this one. And again, we're able to use the optical tracker to see how much time they spend with the novel versus the familiar object. And again, when we compare th this, you can see here the control mice, as you would expect, spends over 75% of their time with the novel object. But look at what the overstimulated mice do. It's 50-50. They don't distinguish at all. It's as if they don't remember which object is novel or they don't care, but they're not functioning like normal mice. Now for the second part of my talk, I wanna to switch to talking about the behavioral aspects of early media usage in children. And to do this, I wanna set a little bit of context. You know, I started studying media with birth of my son in 1998, and um, I'll put that in, in perspective here. So the very first television you can see here, this is actually an actual picture of it, was invented in 1927. Um, the next thing to come along was the, uh, was the color television in 1943. The first liquid, uh, this is not a picture of the first LCD, but it, 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 you get the picture, it was in 1964. And so you can see that really from the invention of television forward, not much changed. We added color, we made the screen smaller, but the experience was always one of sitting and watching something, a, a, a passive experience, if you will. And it wasn't until 11 years ago that there was a dramatic change in the way we, ex we, we experience screens. When Steve Jobs introduced the iPad almost exactly 11 years ago, um, it was in fact a game changer because it created the possibility of contingent responses that you could touch the screen and it would, it would react to you. And it would, be, it, would, it would present you with novel stimuli that were uniquely tailored to your own experience. Now, one of the inventors of the iPad uh, said this, I wake up in cold sweats every so often thinking, what did we bring into the world? Steve Jobs himself, as many of you may know, was a low tech parent and didn't let his children play with uh, the devices that, 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 that made him uh, fabulously wealthy and that we all have grown to love. When I saw these quotes, I was reminded of this one from Oppenheimer, um, which many of you are probably familiar with. And I, I put this up here not to be alarmist, although one could rightly say that invoking atomic bombs is being in fact alarmist, but I put it up here to show that in fact, it's not uncommon for inventors of a technology to, uh, with, with an, one intended purpose to come to regret some of the other effects that that technology has. And I think that's been tr shown to be true for many of the inventors of these touchscreens for children. I, I, th th I cannot pronounce his name, this person's name correctly, but um, he was a 28 year old boilermaker in Korea, in South Korea, who became the poster child uh, at the time for digital addiction. He left work on Friday afternoon, went to an internet cafe and dropped dead Sunday evening after having played 40 hours of uh, StarCraft uh, without eating or drinking. This got the Korean government very interested in the problem of digital addiction. And in fact, it's more prevalent in Asian countries. And they're also way ahead of us in terms of preventing and treating it. When we think of addictions, most of us, of course, think of pharmacological ones, opioids, alcohol, and nicotine. Um, the only behavioral addiction that's officially recognized in the DSM-5 is gambling. But the truth is that they both uh, have a common pathway in the brain, which is the dopamine reward pathway, which briefly starts in the ventral tegmental area, which sends a signal to the nucleus accumbens, which is the pleasure center of the brain. It's experienced as a reward. And the nucleus accumbens in turn sends a signal to the prefrontal cortex, which says in effect, uh, I liked that, uh, do that again, get more of that. It's a generic pathway, it can be activated by anything, including even praising children for behaviors you like, which is the primary mechanism by which you reinforce behaviors in children. And I wanna talk a little bit about the formation of habit. A lot of what we know about it comes from uh, Julio, who's a, a monkey as you can see here, 
and a German uh, neuroscientist named Wolf ran, and they together did a series of experiments. Uh, Julio was placed in a, in, a, in a chamber like this one. There was a recording electrode measuring activity in his nucleus accumbens. There was a dispenser here of blackberry juice, which was his favorite. There's a response bar for him to push, and there's a stimulus screen that he looks at. And the idea here is that when, when Julio sees the stimulus on the screen, he pushes the response bar and he gets some blackberry juice. And all the while, the activity in his nucleus accumbens is being measured. What you see here is the activity in his nucleus accumbens while he's being trained, while he's learning how to get the reward. And you see that the shape appears on the screen. He pushes the lever, he gets the juice, and you see a huge surge here in activity in the pleasure center of his brain. But over time, as Julio learns how this game, if you will, is played, look at what happens. The shape appears on the screen. He has a huge surge in, his, in, in, in activity in his pleasure center. Then he pushes a lever and he gets the juice. So he's come to understand the conditioning so well that he experienced the pleasure just on seeing the stimulus, not in getting the reward itself. We see the same effect play out in children. So this is, this is data from a meta-analysis. Uh, looking at the presence, just the physical presence of a phone of, of a, in, in children's bedroom and sleep problems. And the presence of a phone in, in children's room increases the likelihood of sleep problems by almost 80%. Why? Because of that habit formation. Just knowing the phone is there makes them arouse, makes them wonder what's on the phone. Now, I mentioned before that I'm not here to tell you that media are a bad thing. In fact, it, the truth is that there's a lot of good in them. The better metaphor may really be to think of it in the context of too much of a good thing. Now, as an epidemiologist, one of the hardest things to look for are what you know we think of as sort of nonlinear relationships, relationships that are not uh, monotonically increasing as um, as we saw with uh, self-control and adult outcomes. One classic example of this, the sort of inverted U, is with alcohol intake and risk of, of, of death later in life. The assumption for many years was that alcohol is a toxin. We know that too much of it is bad. And so any amount is bad. And we expect there to be a linear relationship between the two of them. But in fact, as is seen here, as I think as many as you know, mild to moderate drinking for both men and women, this is pre-pandemic, I might point out, was associated with improved health outcomes. It's only when you cross 17.6 drinks per week for women, 21.2 drinks for men, that your risk is the same as a teetotaler. And then in fact, it goes up the more you drink above that level. We see a similar relationship, for example, with screen time use in children and depression risk. Mod, mild to moderate uh, usage of screens is associated with a decreased risk of depression compared to non-users. But after a threshold of about two hours, we see a consistent increase in risk of depression. Now the DSM-5 in 2013 classified internet gaming disorder as being in need of further study. I happen to be on the DSM-5 revision committee and we're in the process of trying to get it in to the DSM-5R. The WHO in 2018 went further and classified gaming disorder as a new disorder. The epidemiology of gaming disorder uh, varies by five to 12%. As I mentioned before, it's more common in Asian countries. It's also more common in children with ADHD, with depression and with anxiety. But from my position, the focus on gaming, if you will, is way too limited. Because for one thing, it's incredibly dated. What about apps and social media? It's also quite gendered because at least historically, boys have preferred games and girls have preferred social media. That's changing now, but that's been historically true. I prefer the term digital addiction, and it's the word we use in my lab when we look at this. It says, if you read this, someone stole my iPhone. Now, I talked about Julio at, um, and Wolfram before. Another sort of seminal work in, uh, scientist in this area is, of course, B.F. Skinner, who you might remember from Psychology 101, who did a series of experiments with rats and actually with birds, where he put them in this operand botch, box and try to condition them to stare at the light here. And he would do this by having a response lever, uh, a food dispenser, uh, a loudspeaker, and an electrified grid. And he would do a series of manipulations to try to get the rat to obsessively stare at the light. If he were doing it today, his model would be this. 
Now, let's just briefly revisit some of Skinner's findings. He found that if you reward the behavior by giving the rat uh, a, a pellet when it pushes the lever when the light goes on, you reinforce it. We see this in multiple games and apps where touching something, pushing something uh, gets you points, gets you objects, gets you likes, et cetera. One of the more interesting things that Skinner found was that if you make the reward unpredictable, not every pull gets a pellet. The rat is much more likely to be um, addicted to staring at the light. And, and this is very much true in games and apps today. Valued objects appear at random. If you think for a minute, if Instagram only updated your likes or your thumbs up or whatever they are once a day, if you could only check on it at 6 p.m. every day, you would not be picking up the phone all the time. You would wait until six, there'd be no point. But you, 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 we're so conditioned to not knowing, have I gotten another like, has I gotten another text? They can appear at any time, including incidentally in the middle of the night. So um, it's, it's BF Skinner revisited. And the final thing that Skinner showed was that if you punish avoidance, if the rat, rat misses an opportunity to push the lever and you shock it, it also increases their obsession with the light. And there are many games and many apps that um, explicitly penalize you for leaving, the, the, whether it's FOMO or, um, or consequences in, an, in, an, in, a, in a global conflict game, they try to keep you in there. Now Vygotsky, who was sort of the father of developmental psychology, talked about children's development with, with respect to three zones. Um, the inner zone is a series of things, activities that a child can do completely independently. The outer zone are things that they're incapable of doing, incapable of doing regardless. It's just beyond their ability in, developmentally. And this zone of proximal development is the zone of activities that a child can do with assistance. And it's immensely gratifying to them to learn something new and to bring it into their sphere of things they can do independently. This has been now, since his work, been generalized to experiences across the age spectrum. Um, and it's, it's frequently referred to as a psychology of optimal experience. So if you see in this graph here, if you're put in a situation where your skills are low and the challenges are high, it's anxiety provoking. And if your skills are high and the challenges are low, it leads to boredom. The flow channel, if you will, is that area where your skills and your challenges are tightly matched so that you're maximally engaged and they ratchet up over time so that you maintain that level of engagement. And this is exactly what games and apps do. They des they're designed to put you into the flow channel. It's no coincidence, the makers of these games and apps hire PhD neuroscientists specifically for this purpose. And part of the reason for this is there's been an evolution in the gaming business model. Uh, when I was a child, you bought video games, you owned them. When my children were children, uh, there was a transition to this subscription model where you would pay a monthly fee to have it. And of course now um, we've switched to the game is free um, and the money is made by getting you to stay on it. So a classic example of this is Fortnite, which if you have, preschool, if you have middle school kids you're familiar with, it has over 200 million users. It's free to play, but it's made over a billion dollars by in-app purchases that children make and an untold amount of data, amount of money via selling children's data. Another example is Snapchat, which you might be familiar with, but Snapchat was competing um, with Instagram and, uh, and other apps for, 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 for attention and for dollars. And so uh, they had the brilliant idea, brilliant in quotes, to invent what's called the Snapchat streak. And if you don't know what that is, what that is is if I Snapchat my friend and they Snapchat me back the same day, that's a streak of one. And we go back and forth like that, building the streak, keeping the streak alive, if you will. And it, it tracks it for us. Now, I can assure you that the makers of Snapchat didn't do this because they were interested in promoting uh, friendship amongst children. They did it specifically because they knew it would keep children engaged in the, in the app. Here are some quotes from children with respect to their experiences and what they think of as uh, streaks on, on, on Snapchat. And you can see it's, it's, it's sad to read these. I mean, it's sad to see that, 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 that children have come to equate their Snapchat streak with the intensity and, 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 and depth of, uh, of their friendship with another child. 
it's it's become such a phenomenon that they're actually third party apps that keep the keep the streak alive. They automatically Snapchat back and forth for you so that you can maintain these friendships without even having to do the Snapchatting yourself. All of this has come to pass because we live in this attentional economy. All of those buttons on your screen are monetizing the amount of time you spend on all of them to the extent that you have experiences like this. And we think about addiction, we think about, about it typically as an intersection between nature and nurture. Um, it's been true of alcohol and gambling that you have a genetic predisposition to develop this addiction and then prolonged exposure to that substrate pushes you into having the addiction. But in this case, the nurture is ubiquitous. It's almost as if we live in a society where everybody is mandated to drink three or four glasses of wine a day. If we did that, everybody who was predisposed to develop alcoholism would. So the situation we find ourselves in, if you're genetically at high risk to develop digital, at risk, I should say, to develop digital addiction, you're at high risk. You're very likely to develop it. This is a picture from Newcastle Airport in 1990. Uh, that I found on the internet. And it's, it's interesting to me um, for many reasons, but one of which is that you can see the vast number of people here that are what we used to call doing nothing. And when I sh showed this picture to my son, uh, he said, this is what they are thinking. Um, it's vastly different from what airports look like today. Those of us that have been to an airport in the past year, where as we all know, everybody is tethered to their device at all times. Now we typically think of digital addiction as affecting older adolescents and adults, but my lab focuses on birth to five and I happen to believe that infants may be at the greatest risk. And I wanna show you why uh, in conclusion here with some of the work we're doing in the lab now. There are two parts of infancy that are germane here. The first is that infants are born wired to try to understand causality. And the second is the violation of expectation paradigm. So babies are born without knowing the rules of the world they inhabit, and they spend an enormous amount of mental energy. All those synapses they're creating early in their brain development are trying to understand cause and effect. What makes something happen? Which brings me to this question. What is the one thing a child never says, or if they're pre-verbal, never thought when they were using the old media that dominated the landscape for all those years? And the answer is, I did it because they didn't do anything. It's entirely a passive experience, right? They're just sitting there watching. Those of you that have children or grandchildren, if I ask you what this child is gonna do, you will assuredly tell me that, that, that she's gonna throw those toys on the ground. She's probably already done it. And the first time parent will pick up the toys and put them back and the child will do it again and be delighted by it. Why? Because she has made something happen. And she's reinforced that by doing it over and over again. She understands now a causal loop. She can throw something on the ground, it'll make her mom or dad come put it back and she can repeat that. Now parents tire of that game and pretty quickly realize we're not putting the toys on here anymore. And the typical toddler will then have a tantrum, but the iPad never tires. So the baby looking at the iPad and touching it and getting and listening a response, um, is gratified by that. And the iPad is, is there all day. It, it, it's not going anywhere. It's never gonna say enough. Now, the second thing I wanna talk about is the violation of expectation paradigm I mentioned. Now, all of that energy spent trying to figure out causality um, can, be, uh, can be really challenged when things that aren't expected happen. So this is a, this is a demonstration of that. If you bring an infant it, uh, into the lab, uh, as we've done, and you put them in front of a puppet show and you track their eyes and you show them a puppet show with two puppets, you close the curtain and you open it and there's still two puppets and you look to see how long they stare at the, at the theater. And you compare that to this scenario. What we find, what others find, is that the child will stare much longer at this than at the other one. Why? Because you've rocked their world. This is not what they expected. They, they don't understand how it could possibly have happened. And the iPad, either by design, right, or just by happenstance, will simultaneously reinforce children's sense of causal uh, relationships and violate their expectations because they, they'll push something they didn't mean to push and something unexpected will happen. We test this in the lab, and I'll show you one of the ways we test it 
using what's called a response to behavior request. And so we bring 18 to 24 month old infants into the lab and we randomize them across three conditions to play with Elmo's guitar, to play with an app that's a piano app that sort of simulates that and to play Peg's Parade. And Peg's Parade is a app, as you'll see, that has predicted and unpredictable features. All kinds of things are going on. The child can push and make things happen and things will happen that they don't expect. So here's what happens. They play with the toy and at a pre-specified time, one of my research assistants will ask them to return it. And we measure the latency and the willingness to return it. So here's an example of the three conditions. Good job. Okay, let's clean up. So that's condition one. Here is condition two. I don't And now I want to show you what Peg's Parade looks like so you have some sense of how it's different. Choice. Three, two, one. Click a friend to add them to your band. Add more you friends to your band. You can see things that are blinking here, that if the child touches, something will pop up. Sometimes things pop up unexpectedly. And here's Nora again playing with this. You can see that she's punching it to make things happen. She's look, she's totally absorbed in it. She's trying to figure out what's going on. And now even in the process of pull, pulling it back, she touched it and made something happen. Give it to me. And when we compare across the three conditions, what we see is in fact, the highly quote unquote engaging apps like Peg's Parade, children are much less likely to uh, return them. I wanna talk a little bit about a way forward because I mentioned I wanna talk about some positive aspects of apps. Um, I'm asked all the time, what is a good app for children to play? And I, I never recommend one typically one because there are literally hundreds of thousands of them and I have not uh, evaluated virtually any of them. Um, but there is one exception to that, and that's uh, oh, and then the other thing is none of them have been studied in any way robustly. One exception to that is this game called Bedtime Math, and if you don't know it, I recommend it. Um, it's a very simple game. It downloads a story each night uh, or each day to your device, and you read the story to your toddler, and then you decide if you want to do a simple, uh, medium, or hard question afterwards. And Bedtime math was actually studied in a randomized controlled experiment with first grade children, so six-year-olds in 22 Chicago area schools. They were randomized to bedtime math or bedtime reading, uh, which is a very strong control, right? very similar thing, but focused on reading, not math. And math achievement was measured at the beginning and the end of the school year. And what you can see here is that um, the math group improved significantly uh, compared to the reading group in their um, in, in, their, in their math knowledge. And the effects were even larger in parents who self-reported that they were math anxious. Now, think about what this app is for a second. This is not an app that you hand to a child and walk away, right? This is an app that you use with your child that cues up an opportunity for that scaffolding, for that zone of proximal development. And that to me is really the sweet spot of what these apps can do to enhance child development, to find opportunities for parents and children to meaningfully engage with each other. One more recent example of that is an app that I had some role in my lab in helping to develop, which is the Laugh app, uh, which focuses on art, music, and breathing. It's designed by the Katherine Meyer Foundation, and we, we helped do some formative work in my lab to put it together. So I'll conclude now by telling you, or hoping that I've convinced you that early childhood for children and for mice is critical to their development. 
and that children need more real-time play uh, and less fast-paced media in their lives. Because as we say in my lab, the, the mantra, if you will, is that if you change the beginning, you change the whole story. Uh, thank you very much. It really has been an honor in spite of all of the glitches and uh, I'm happy to take questions. I wanna acknowledge my collaborators, my research staff and my children who are my inspiration for this work. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dimitri. Let me wait just a minute. We're not seeing um, uh, questions being placed in the Q&A, but if you do have questions, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A and uh, we'll be able to take uh, a look at them. A little bit, Dimitri, you show, you know, results um, early on in life by, you know, two years old and um, projections, you know, based on that. Um, what, what's the answer to the question, is it ever too late to start? You know, <laughs> so uh, I just visited the four-year-old grandkids, twins, and, you uh, um, and their their parents might say, "Gee, maybe we had a little too much uh, stimulative, you know, uh, stuff like that." Um, is a kid already sunk? <laughs> or, no, the kid, uh, <laughs> the kid is. I, I'm sure, given the combination of of nature and nurture and your grandson's grandchildren's ex experience, I'm sure they'll be fine, John. You know, I get asked this a lot. In fact, it's one of the one of the distressing things about showing this research to parents around the world is that invariably many parents feel guilty and say, oh my God, I did everything wrong. If it's any consolation, I did too. <laughs> I didn't yeah. uh, have the benefits of my own research when I was raising my children. They were the inspiration for me to do it in the first place. So um, I don't think it's, 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 it's ever too late, but at the same time for people that are either having children or have young children, it, I, I hope that they take this, uh, this advice mindfully. Yeah, thanks. Uh, universal parent response, oh my God, look at how much I've done wrong. Right. Well, um, it, you know, it's, it, there's a common adage amongst those of us who study child development, which was that the, the best parents feel the guiltiest um, yeah. because you're 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 applying kind of QI standards to your parenting. Right. So let me. We've gotten a, a couple of questions now. What is a good way to educate your child about the dangers and risks of screen addiction? It's it's a really good question, and you know, I I, I talked briefly about the model of alcohol, and I think, you know, it's a weird. It's a weird thing to, uh, to think about with your children, but I think that that's really the way we have to think about it, which is to say that um, these things need to be thought of as an addictive uh, product that if used judiciously is fine, but you have to learn to moderate it. You have to consciously develop that skill um, because they're trying to draw you in and you need to develop the capacity to resist the urge or to walk away. Um, you know, when my, uh, son was young and his game of choice at the time was Minecraft, we had limits on it. And um, initially uh, he found it very discombobulating that the time would run out and he had to get off. And we started a policy of a two minute warning. I would give him two minutes and, and, and then we would take it away. And that didn't work either because the game was designed to never have a good moment to leave. So we, we, I, I realized at the time that in fact, it's fine. He should actually learn that you, you just walk away from the game in the middle of it and suffer the quote unquote consequences. Um, and that's what we did, uh, you know, to, 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 to cultivate the skill of the, the, the device doesn't own me. I, 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 uh, I command it. So let me, uh, how do you think your research uh, should influence how uh, virtual schooling curricula are developed and rolled out? It's an excellent question. You know, before before the pandemic even started, I I, I serve on the um, board of children, youth, and families for the National Academy of Sciences, and have been trying for five years to get them to do a study, a, a synthesis study, you know, a consensus report of uh, technology in schools. I've wanted to do this because um, I get asked this all the time, pre-pandemic. Why are kids so technology dependent in school and out of school? Right? We we have expectations that children are on screens all the time. And the truth is that um, the assumption has always been that educational technology is good. And in fact, we've gone from the early 70s when there were uh, 20 students per computer in a classroom to today where there are three students per computer in a classroom. And over that 40, 50 year period, we haven't seen our relative standing and test scores internationally go up at all. I mean, those are ecological data, but clearly if computers in the classroom were some kind of a miracle teaching device, we would have expected to see some benefits. Um, now, the pandemic, of course, has made all of this even um, more essential. 
because we've come to rely on it. And the truth is we don't know a lot about it because there haven't been many studies that have looked at it. I can tell you as a, as a researcher in early childhood that, um, that, that Zoom doesn't work for primary school children. And in fact, we, we did a study to show what the deficits, what the damage done to children by having them essentially miss school by getting it over Zoom. Uh, you know, the most engaging, terrific, wonderful in-person teacher is at best a boring TV show when, <laughs> when she or he is on a two-dimensional screen. It's very, very hard to engage young children. I, I think we do need to learn about how to make distance learning work. Um, hopefully not for this pandemic, as I, I, I expect, I demand that children return to school uh, in the fall, if not before. I've been advocating for that really since last March. We've done a huge disservice to our children keeping them out of school this long. Another just, question uh, here. Yeah, thank you. Um, do any of the tech companies share their research as they produce and sell products? It's an excellent question. Um, and together with many other researchers, we have, um, we have uh, begged uh, the developers to share the data they have. Because what we really need to better understand this relationship is much more granular data than we're able to collect, right? We typically, I mean, historically we asked, we literally asked parents and teenagers, how much time do you spend on your device? Right, so that has very little external validity anyway, certainly when you're talking about teenagers self-reporting their phone use. And it doesn't get to the content, which is really what drives the effects, as I showed even in preschool children, just based on pacing. Now, it's impossible for us to get these data with, with any degree of granularity, but, but the purveyors of these products have them an incredible granularity. Um, I wrote an editorial about this some time ago um, in, in JAMA, saying that we, we really won't be able to understand digital addiction well unless tech companies share their data with us. Um, Apple has been, primarily because they champion privacy, has made this uh, not something they're willing to do. Although interestingly, I was just talking yesterday with the developer of an app who said that they are currently apparently under tremendous pressure uh, considering, considering making allowances for IRB approved studies to partner with researchers and share the data that they have on exactly what children are doing on their devices. Oh, that's good news. Um, so this one from the chair of pediatrics, whom you might know. And, uh, uh, she asked us as, as an active clinician herself, what are some of the best ways to engage parents uh, in moving from their own devices to interact with their child and the child's devices? Um, how much time do you think they should spend doing so? Well, there's a lot of there's lots of that question, Leslie. Thanks for asking it. I mean, I you know I think that the phenomenon of distracted parenting is a real one, and you know one of the tips that I give to parents when I'm talking to them is that that their child is watching their behavior um, really from infancy on. One of the reasons that one of the most popular toys for young children, infants even, is a fake cell phone is because that infant has come to view this object as valuable. They see everyone in their family looking at it, and they want one just like it. Uh, that alone should give us pause. Uh, we don't want babies to be thinking that the most important thing in, in, in their life, in their future, is going to be a phone. I, I, I cannot emphasize enough that families and, and parents need to have digital downtime um, to be uh, authentically present for each other. Um, some people have go so far as to have lockboxes where everybody in the, in the family puts the phone in for pre-specified times during the day, whether it's the end of school, certainly during mealtime, sometime in the evening, um, it's, it's, it's essential to do that. Let, let me just, there's a question about, um, was this recorded and will it be posted? Yes, you can find those on the RGE website. Uh, Judy, if you have any trouble, Judy Wasserheit, uh, give me an email and I'll, I'll get you the link. Uh, one more, and we're a bit past time. Can you say more about the use of interactive games like uh, Roblox, for middle schools. My daughter plays this game to connect with her friends. Um, and that's been more popular with the daughter since the pandemic. Yeah, you know, the early data that are coming in have shown that in fact, um, children have relied understandably on, on, on various platforms, including gaming platforms to, to socially connect with other children. I, as the pandemic is hopefully starting to end, um, I think it's really important that we be very mindful of the 
uh, the fact that many children have become more dependent on these devices. You know, or, and I, I, full disclosure, I, I, I'm somewhat culpable here. When I was being interviewed in the early phases of the pandemic, in, in spite of all of my, the caveats I've given here, I, I publicly gave advice to parents, either in person or through the media, that um, that they didn't that they should sort of throw caution to the wind. Desperate times require desperate actions. Now is not the time to worry about your child's media usage or over usage. I regret having said that. I mean, I said it not expecting that 15 months later, um, children will be spending as much time as they are. The early evidence coming in suggests that recreational screen time has doubled in middle school and high school children. Um, and keep in mind that a lot of that time has been spent on games and apps that are designed to be um, addictive. So I really do fear that we're going to have a problem in the fall. Um, I'm not answering your, your question too specifically, um, but I, I think that, you know, you need to have healthy limits on screen use and the guardrails that were present pre-pandemic need to be reintroduced, uh, ideally gradually, much the same way we might wean people off a drug, but I would start to do it now um, if you haven't already. Uh, knowing that you're going to have problems, I mean, knowing that there's going to be pushback uh, from your children, but the, the, we need to we need to get them back to some sense of normalcy. All right, great, Dimitri. Uh, thanks. Questions took us about ten minutes over time. Uh, certainly, a very high level of interest. Really appreciate it. Very informative talk. Thank My you. My pleasure. Sorry about the technical glitches. Bye bye. <laughs> no, not at all. Bye bye.